All right, I want you to look at a couple of scriptures here. Thank you, Benjamin. Glory to God. Wasn't an, uh, worship awesome tonight? What an, an anointing tonight. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. And I, I got a lot of word to get to you tonight, but let me do this, and we're going to receive the tithes and offerings. I want to put a couple things in your spirit because I, I want to sow the word of God into your spirit. And listen, be in prayer. I tell you, we are on the brink of some amazing, amazing breakthroughs. And we're just seeing what God is doing some stuff. <laughs> Hallelujah. In fact, where's my sister? Where are you? Joy, Joy. Are you in here, Joy? Joy, Joy, Joy. Come come here. Joy and full. Come on, Joy and full of glory. Come on up here real quick. Quick, quick, quick. Uh, she's covering her mouth again. I, no, come bring her up. Help her because she needs help. She's, on, she's, she, she's having abundance of joy. Glory. Uh, oh, my Lord Jesus. Now, I don't know enough of the story, so I hope she can t- testify because I, I only know a little bit. Li- li- uh, uh-huh. Who knows the whole story? All right. All right. We'll just let her and go ba ba ba, and we'll let. <laughs> now I'm trying. <laughs> Hallelujah. So, so what, 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 what happened to, I mean, what was the condition of her brother? Well, her, her brother uh, had surgery, and they discovered that he had, uh, they had tumors taken out, and he still had some left, and they were stage four, and they were not good. And so we were greeting on Saturday night. Good, there she is. Yeah. We were greeting Saturday night. She shared this with us. I said, well, that's not of God. Let's pray about this. So he went into surgery, and they had tumors left, uh, and, and they left some tumors, and they were stage four cancer. Right. And so Joy stands, in, and they, I said, you got to stand in the gap for your brother. Stand in the gap, and we're going to lay hands on you, and God's going to heal him. And so as he's, oh, beloved, I'm t- <laughs> Five of us were there. We just cut loose. We just cut loose. And I, and I just saw those, like they were exploding in his body. It's just like God showed me the tumors were like going. And I said, man, this. How was that? If you're a grandpa, you know what your five-year-old grandson does. Everything's. Yeah, it's great. So are you the grandpa or the five-year-old? Yeah. Yeah. So, so okay. So, and so, you know, and, and uh, you know, like you do, you pray and you just know God's done it. Yeah. yeah. So tonight, she's been waiting and waiting and waiting for the word. on. Uh, yeah, and tonight, as, as you and I walked in, she got the word. And he's cancer free. Cancer free. I mean, <laughs> woo! Cancer free. Doctor said, ah, come back about every three months for an MRI, but you're all done. It's gone. <laughs> woo! I- I'm with you. <laughs> Glory to God. That was a good job testifying, Joy. Thank you. Now, I literally, as I, she got the text as I walked in, I walked up and she's going, and I was like, what, some serious bad breath or something? What's going on? And then she showed me the text. She couldn't even read it. Absolutely amazing. God is good. Somebody say God wants to have us to have an abundance. In every area, God promises to meet the needs of consistent givers. God promises to meet the needs of consistent givers. You know, in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, after faithfully giving to Paul's ministry, God promised, but my God shall supply. I'm waiting for that word to really come out of your spirit. All my need. Now, let me put it in your spirit. What is your need level? Your need level is not what you have to have to bear to survive. Come on, your need level is what you have to have to be most abundant. I was just hearing a story about a, a church. Uh, thank God for some Holy Ghost churches. There are some Holy Ghost churches in Dallas-Fort Worth. And there's a wonderful church in the south part of Fort Worth. And, and um, uh, the pastor's wife was getting ready to go over to Mozambique to spend a little time with Heidi Baker. And, um, 
And I just heard about this day. I just thought there was a school. And the Spirit of God came on her in the Sunday service before they left. And she said, God spoke to me that you're that people in this congregation, that you're supposed to take your shoes off and give your shoes. And we're going to bring them over to Mozambique. And you just leave home without any shoes. <laughs> Hallelujah. And that's what we all look at me. I ain't giving up my shoe. That's the problem. They ain't got no shoes. And you got, you got more than you could wear in a month. Hello. And so they just emptied off the shoe, and they had pictures of people walking out bare, bare, we're just barefoot or just in socks. And, and she, she loaded them all up and brought them over there and didn't tell Heidi Baker what was happening. And when they showed up, and she said, I got something for you, opened up, and Heidi Baker was blown away because Heidi Baker said, we have been praying for shoes. Come on, somebody, amen. And they brought them an abundance of shoes, glory to God. And then the Lord spoke to him, uh, spoke to her to deliver a word, and I believe I'm going to paraphrase it, but it was basically, I took you to a land uh, that w- of a people that were hungry, and I gave them an abundance. Now I'm sending you back to a land of abundance, and pray that I bring, I give them hunger. Come on, amen. Hallelujah. I remember a, a man one time. He sat there in a, a pastor in America, and he was talking to a precious dear pastor from Africa. And he said, oh, brother, we pray for you. I want, we want to know, we pray for you. We pray for you because of your intense poverty over there. And he said, oh, thank you, brother. But we got to, you got to know, we pray for you. We are interceding for you because of your abundant prosperity. Because sometimes we can get, God wants us to be prosperous, but we can get, we can get deluded and deceived into, the, into that. Amen. Someone say the devil's a liar. See, I will, that's what I love about the Philippians because they gave time and again. They were not the richest church in the region, but they gave time again under the spreading of the gospel. And that was the one that the promises came to. My God. In fact, Paul said, you only time and again gave unto my need. I went to all these other places, planted all these other churches, and they did not continue to support me. But you... In Philippi, you continue to support me time and again. Now I got a promise and a prophecy of God for you. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. We love to quote that scripture without the condition. Come on, amen. The condition was they were givers, and not just givers, they were givers into missions. I just 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 drop that in your spirit. <laughs> God also promises to prosper givers more than enough. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 from the Living Bible says this. God is able to make it up to you by giving you everything you need and more so that there will not only be enough for your own needs, but plenty left over to give joyfully to others. Hallelujah. How many like giving to others? I like giving to others. I like taking people out to eat. I really do. Some of y'all, I know the young people say, amen, brother, come on. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it, it's very often, most, most well, I shouldn't say that because then people, but, I, I, I mean, I love, I love, we, we go out and eat a lot after services, and I love inviting people, and I love paying for them. I, it's a joy of mine. Amen? I like to make people fat. <laughs> I enjoy that. I enjoy, I enjoy being able to give to, there's a joy about that. Amen? Hallelujah. 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 I tell you, I feel, who glory to God. Shakarabasahande. Shikahande. Who? Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I tell you, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm expecting the day to come soon when God's going to so bless me that I'll just be, every time I go somewhere, I drop a $100 tip. Not one of those little fake million dollar ones that are a track. Come on, some people, if you want them to read it, stick $100 in, t- in front of it. <laughs> then they might read the track. But, whoo, glory to God. Hallelujah. He wants us to have plenty left over to give joyfully to others. Notice it didn't say to, to hoard it. Boy, it's quiet right now. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Maybe that's why, maybe that we get, we're so, because we operate in fear. Let me tell you something. All it takes is one day for the dollar to completely crash in value, and all that you've been hoarding doesn't mean anything anyways. Uh, yeah? Woo! Father, I give you praise. So might as well store up some, some get, get some, <laughs> might as well get a bank account and a reservoir account in heaven going on. Hallelujah. Man, thank you, Lord. My God. 
There's a lot of things I want to say right there, but I'm just going just going to leave it. God's going to change us around from a materialistic society, a materialistic church, to a church that knows how to gather wealth. God wants to put things in your hand. I'm just speaking prophetically tonight. Hope you don't mind. God wants to put things in your hand that are going to reproduce, that will continue to regenerate, <laughs> so that you're not consumers, but you're creators. And whoo, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Shahande. Come on, I'd rather invest once in two cows and let them reproduce and have a lifetime of, of, of produce. Come on, amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Mm. Anyways, shoot. God promises to bless his obedient children. Isaiah 119 says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. It's not wrong to eat the good of the land. Boy, it's quiet now. Did God create the earth? So why is the best of it reserved for the heathen? That's right, we haven't taken dominion. It belongs to God and to God's people. Hallelujah. Just, just, just put a couple things in your spirit. Jesus is a scripture, so don't get mad at me. Get mad at God. He wrote it. God promises. Uh, he promises also blessing to his patient children. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10 from the Living Bible says, For God who gives seed to the farmer to plant, and later on, good crops to harvest and eat will give you more and more seed to plant and will make it grow so that you can give away more and more fruit from the harvest. Hallelujah. Now, one of the problems is what we have, whew, and I feel those presents. I, I got to, I got to get to the other part. Oh, come on. One of the problems is we keep eating the seed. And we don't even recognize and discern what the seed is. Sometimes you got to understand. You say, well, Lord, I only got this little bit, and it's not enough to meet my need. Hallelujah. You already got a revelation. Then that seed. Because <laughs> if it ain't enough to meet the need, then it's got to be really, it, then it might be seed. I remember one time I heard a story about Creflo Dollar. He was, he was believing he needed about a million dollars for a project they were going into, and a woman sold her house and gave him a $180,000 check. Oh, I receive it. And he got that, and he was so excited because, you know, they would, they would, they, they, the money, they were having a little time coming in, and the money came in, and he looked at it and said, I got a million-dollar project. I got $180,000. Hallelujah! I got seed. And he turned around and gave it all away. Wow! I mean, come on. How many of us would be like, oh, we're, we're 18% there? Right, 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 right. But they, they've got a hold of a principle, and they said, no, this is not enough to meet the need, but I, I, it's, a, it's a fantastic seed. And my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory, and given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. So I am going to be a seed time and harvest person, and I'm not going to eat my seed. I'm going to sow my seed. And I'm going to live off the harvest and have abundance that I can joyfully give to others. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Father, we give you praise. Constant, prosper, obedient, patient givers. Constant, proper, obedient, patient givers receive an abundant harvest from their giving. Consistent. Every say consistent. Say proper. Say obedient. And say patient. Those are the kind of givers that God abundantly prospers. In Jesus' name, amen. Ushers, if you come on forward, Father, we give you praise and glory and honor. We thank you for the power of your word, God. We thank you for your principles as we come and we bring our tithes and we sow our seeds, God. We bring our offerings and we function in the principles of the kingdom. In Jesus' mighty name, and everybody said amen. Amen. Ushers, go ahead and receive. You guys can uh, grab me my, my chalkboard. And while they're doing that, I uh, also remind you, those that weren't here over the weekend, uh, my new book, Grace is Not a Get Out of Hell Free Card. It's already stirring up quite a firestorm on Facebook. It really is. 
I mean, what do you mean by that? I'm sure it is, you know, and I'm in this whole debate on grace. As a matter of fact, I got into, I, I, I know I put down my commandments on my Facebook commandments, y'all, y'all. Yeah. They're good. Uh, I violated one yesterday, but I, I, <laughs> I got into a one hour long Facebook chat, but with this young man, but way back in my youth group days that led to the Lord. And he's been doing this thing on grace and he keeps kind of, but he, it, it's like, it just felt wrong. And just the way he, some of the stuff he said was right, but it was an extreme element to it. And you'd almost think from the way he was talking that every single person out there outside of this new quote-unquote grace crowd wants to beat everybody up with nothing but judgmentalism and beat them up with nothing but, but lit law because that's all, the only option he gave. And so I started walking him through the process and and, and I was talking about the word, and he said, well, and he kept talking about, well, the Holy Spirit will reveal, the Holy Spirit will reveal. And I started realizing that he was diminishing the power and the importance of the word. The word takes precedence over any personal revelation. I'm going to say that again. Say it after me, the word takes precedence over any personal revelation. See, every cult, every great perversion of doctrine and Scripture throughout history was driven by people who took either a portion of Scripture and ignored the rest of the Scriptures or claimed very often that they had a special divine revelation from God that is in addition to the written Word of God. In fact, Mormonism is built on that whole premise. Mormonism is built that Joseph Smith claimed that an angel, moron, I mean, moron, moron, whatever, the, uh, what was it, Mor, 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 moron, moron, it's a moron, demon. It was, moron, moron, now I'm stuck. I'm, moroni, moroni, woo, all right. Which is actually the name of a demon spirit in the satanic Bible, just, just for your information, appeared to him, gave him this little special, you know, spyglass from the bottom of Jack and, you know, Cracker Jacks. Now gave him this little special decoder thing to look through, to read these stones, I think it was, tablets or scrolls. And then he wrote it down and interpreted it. Of course, we don't have the scrolls and we don't have the little decoder ring. And their claim is, and the reason it's so hard to witness to Mormons is because they have been taught that the Book of Mormon overrides and supersedes the Bible. So that the Bible is true, but the Book of Mormon is truer. And whenever you exalt anything above God's revealed Word, you are in danger. The Word. Ever say the Word. The Word is the root of our lives and the guide to all of our conduct. So we were going through because he was using how people use Scripture to beat people. And there are people that do that. Don't get me wrong. We, we've all seen them out on the street. You know, they're quote-unquote street preachers. Now, we're out there on the streets, and we're seeing thousands and thousands saved. But some of them, we've also dealt with them down in South Lake Town Center. They're down there with their little bullhorns. You're going to hell. You're going to hell. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. That just don't make me want to. You know, get saved. Because frankly, half the people you're talking to you already know it. I mean, I used to sing about it. We begin high and smoking dope and doing lines and saying, man, we're on the highway to hell. We thought it was a big old party place. It doesn't mean anything to them. Now, I'm not saying you don't, there's not a place to say that, but they're just out there screaming and yelling and hollering instead of sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, the fullness of the gospel. They're not operating in the spirit of love. And so I do understand there are those, they're a relatively small group of people, by the way. But this thing is put anytime you use the word as a realm of judgment. But how are we to know the truth? We have a situation. I, I, there was a, there's a young couple that I actually met when I was up in Alaska. They had been part of a discipleship program, and there were some things that went on wrong. Uh, they kind of collapsed, and it got shut down, and then some offense came in. And this couple had uh, started dating, and then they are um, engaged in full marital relations. But they're not married. 
and they claim that the Holy Spirit spoke to them and told them it was okay. So I asked this young man, and I said, how do we know that they are wrong? They claim they've heard by grace through faith. They have heard from God and from the Holy Spirit. I said, how do we know? How do they know they're wrong? They said, he said, by grace through faith. I said, well, they claim the same thing. So how do we know? If you leave it up to personal conviction, which, by the way, nowhere in Scripture says that's how you live your life. Man not, shall not live on bread alone, but by every personal conviction. No, by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. I, and I kept, I kept questioning him. How do you know? How do you know? How do you know? How do you know? And he kept avoiding it and avoiding it. Finally, somebody else pined in and said, you haven't asked Pastor Steve, answered Pastor Steve's question. Kept avoiding it. And then, then he just threw it back, tried to throw it back in my face and, and said, well, God knows you. I pray for all those that are judging my heart. I said, I'm not judging your heart. I'm challenging your doctrine. I believe you mean well, get your head messed up. And your head wouldn't be messed up if you were going to the Word. The Word is the rule of our lives and the guide to our conduct. Now, I agree with the understanding that the Word is not the totality of everything that God will ever say or anything that God will ever do. I believe the Scripture reveals that. It says that if everything Jesus said and did was written down, suppose all the books, in the, or the books that it would take would fill the whole world. However, the Word of God sets the boundaries and the limitations upon which, from which God operates in. And God, by His Holy Spirit, will never reveal something that's contrary to His written Word. That is why the great weapon of our warfare, final weapon of our warfare, Ephesians chapter 6, verse 18, 17, excuse me, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Everybody say the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. Now, in my conversation with this man, young man, I, well, he's not so young anymore. <laughs> in my conversation with the gentleman on Facebook, I kept copying and pasting scriptures. I kept sending him back the Word. Because I wasn't going to get into a debate with him. I was just going to present to him the word. Come on, amen. And I kept bringing him back to the word. He said something. I said, but the word says, and I just paced it. Here's what the word says. And then he said something else. I said, but here's what the word says. When I said that, well, here's what the word says. Because the word is a sword of the spirit. Now, what's very interesting is, our concept of a sword is usually this big old six foot long. Come on, amen. This huge monster sword, you know, Aragorn. That's not what it was. It was actually a dagger. No more than about 12 inches long. And it was designed for hand-to-hand -hand combat. Whoo, hallelujah. And it had two main predominant purposes. It had an offensive purpose and a defensive purpose. In the defensive purpose, it was used not only in fighting hand-to-hand -hand combat, but it was used very often that if you got a wound, they would use that dagger, the sword of the spirit, they would use that dagger to scrape out the bad, the junk of the wound so it could heal properly. And to seal it, cauterize it. Y'all know what that means? It means you just get basically to, 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 like, welcome back, cauterize. Everybody over 40 got that. The rest are like, what? To cauterize it, to seal it, to stop it from its bleeding. And it would, it would use that, that sword of the Spirit. And that's what the Word of God the Word of God, that weapon comes. It's not just a weapon to attack, but it's also this tool that protects us when we do get hit. It cleans out the junk 
Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. Let me get, take you into this. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God, the word that God speaks, this is from the Amplified. For the word that God speaks is alive. Woo, glory to God. And full of power. Making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Penetrating to the dividing line of the breath of life, the soul, and the immortal spirit. And of the joints and marrow of the deepest parts of our nature. Exposing and shifting and analyzing and judging. People say, don't judge me. I didn't. The word did. Don't lie. You're judging me. No, the word did. Boy, it's quiet now. Come on, amen. The word, I'm not judging you. The word did. Word says, don't lie. If you're lying, that's why you got convicted. Because the word, oh, Lord, <laughs> Judging the very thoughts and purposes of the heart. Ooh. See, when the word begins to really come forth, and that's why we need to be churches that preach the word of God. Come on, listen, I'm not trying to be critical, but if you can spend every Sunday service and you go 35-minute little sermonette for Christianettes and all you do is you throw in one cursory scripture, I'm not sure what you're doing because I, I, I don't know about y'all. I need a little more word than that. Because there's a lot of stuff out there. In There's a lot of lies out there that are trying to influence me. And in order for me to stay on the path that God wants me to stay, I need to have the Word. See, one of the reasons I don't trust my own heart, because Pastor Paul said he doesn't trust his own heart. Oh, my. I don't trust my own heart because my heart can lie to me. Because sometimes my heart can say, this is good, and it ain't so good. Come on, Amen. Come on, anybody, don't raise your hand. Anybody ever been in a bad relationship that you thought was good? Huh? Your heart said, this is good. <laughs> but, but if you want to listen to the word, the word might have told you, no. Have, have nothing to do with that unbeliever. I can't tell you how many times people tell me, they told me, oh, Brother Steve, God, God, God led me to this person. They're not saved, but oh, I love them. It just feels so right. I know it's right. No, it's not. The Bible says don't. It says what fellowship does light have with darkness? There's no fellowship. You, if, if you want to really know if it's of God, when you get around that person, just start going, hey, we're going to spend the night together. This is what we're going to do. If they don't join you, it might not be the right person. Well, they go to church with me. I don't care if they go to church with you. Are they, are they going to the presence of God with you? And by the way, young ladies, let me just drop this in there. If the guy you're looking at doesn't love Jesus more than he loves you, you got a problem. Hello. Hallelujah. Whoo. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> just, just to put it in your spirit. Make sure he's a priestly man before you marry him because then he'll be a priestly husband. Don't think you're going to get him spiritual after you get him married to him and then get him in it. Hallelujah. Thank God for the times that happens, but more than often than not, it goes the other direction. Come on. It leads to World War III. She going to church and he hanging out watching football. Oh, I'm talking... And I want you to put something in your spirit. This weekend is going to be probably, I know, I, I just it's going to be probably one of the most important things that we have ever done as a church, ever. And I am going to be preaching on the power of the prophetic blessing. And I want every head of every household and all every child they've got every to be in here. And we're going to release, it's not going to be me. Last week, I, I spoke over you on Sunday morning, the, 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 the priestly blessing, and that was powerful. But now I want to get every family, head of every family, to prophesy over their family. Oh, my. <laughs> Have you ever, I just got, can I give you a little freebie for a moment here? Can I get, take a little sidetrack? Is that all right? Come on, thank you. All right, I'll preach to these guys right here. Come on, not, 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 whew, glory to God. Have you ever wondered, remember, when, remember when you had Jacob, right, and Esau, and their father, the hands were switched, right? 
And once he prayed the blessing over Jacob, he couldn't take it back. Because once this kind of blessing is declared, nothing can reverse it. Oh, my God. Hey, and what we have is we have a whole generation where the spiritual heads of the fam- of the households have not prophesied the blessing, but they've spoken curses. But in one meeting, we can turn that we're going to turn that around and they're going to we're going to prophesy what we want oh my lord have you ever read it come on have you seen in the bible when when they when 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 oh glory to god come on when jacob prophesied over all of his children everything he said came to pass Woo! hallelujah we're going to see a turnaround somebody say there's a power in god's word the first purpose or use for the sword of the spirit is going to uh, uh, is going to bring about a purification. It's going to bring about a purification. Ephesians chapter five verse twenty six says this: that he might sanctify and cleanse her, the church, with what the washing of the water of the word. The word purifies us. I don't, I don't know about y'all. Maybe y'all just like, like, you're just like radical spiritual all the time. But every once in a while, I feel like I get dirty. Come on, sometimes, amen? Sometimes it's because something I saw. Sometimes it's because of something I heard. Sometimes it's because somebody I was around. Hello. Come on, amen? And some, sometimes it's a dream I had. Don't y'all look at me so spiritual. Come on. Anybody ever have a bug-infested dream? That's a dream infested with bugs? Right? Sometimes I have a, a, a dream. Sometimes it's not even anything. You just feel icky. Just, just dirty. Just like, yeah. You know what I mean? You just, you just had some, you just got slimed by some bug, you know? Some demon just slimed you. You just... I mean, you would do it by y'all, y'all experience it. Sometimes it even happens to you in church. You'll be in the middle of worship, and all of a sudden this terrible thought hits you, and you're like, what? Yeah. The Bible says that his word will wash us, will cleanse us, will sanctify. Oh, glory to God. That's why sometimes the best thing you can do is just put on some scripture. Hallelujah. Just start hearing some word. Hallelujah. Let it purify me. Let me cleanse me. See, the devil wants to lie to this generation and say the word is judgmental and it's law and you should avoid it. But but why? Because he wants to keep you dirty and filthy and he wants to remove from you the one thing that can clean you up. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. Jesus said, the words which I speak, they are spirit and they are. How many believe Jesus was telling the truth? So Jesus' words are spirit and they are. So when he said, thou shalt not commit adultery, he was speaking spirit and. See, there's those that will try to tell us that those kind of commands, they're bringing death. No, when it comes from Jesus, it brings life. Lord. Come on, and what the law was powerless to do, that it was weakened by the sinful flesh. The law did not have the power to overcome the sinful flesh, but Jesus condemned sin in the flesh. Romans chapter 8, verse 3. He condemned sin in the flesh and subdued it, robbed it of its power, so that now those words can bring life instead of death. Hallelujah. So when he says, the same God that said, let there be light, and there was light, is the same God that said to you and me, be holy. Hallelujah. Now I can become holy. Hallelujah. Come on. The same God that said, take up your mat and walk, is the same God that said, let this mind be in you, which was all. I can have the mind of Christ. Hallelujah. 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 So these words, which in the old covenant, without the delivering power of the Spirit and the blood of Jesus brought death, now those very words can bring life. Oh, y'all, y'all kind of looking at me strange on that. I get life from this. 
I love the Old and the New Testament. I, he talks to me through it. I get life out of this. I, I don't feel judged and condemned and belittled. I just, I just, I see the revelation of Jesus in all of that. When I see the Old Testament tabernacle and I see the laws concerning the tabernacle, I don't feel, I'm not dumb enough to feel like I have to go outside my back door and dig a hole so I can go to the bathroom. Come on, I, I understand. I have enough wisdom to understand that's not what he's talking about. I understand that those were ceremonial laws, and they were designed to help me avoid something I, our people didn't understand, and that was called germ. And if they did those things, then, then if they did those things, then they were kept, all these diseases were kept from them. Just the same way today. Wash your hands. Use some soap. Come on, amen. It's sanitary laws. I'm able to separate that and understand the sanitary laws. I'm understand the ceremonial laws. But inside of all of them, I see the love of God in that. I don't see rules and regulations. I see God trying to spare his people from sickness and disease. Come on, amen. Hallelujah. When I see them say they don't take on the tattoos or the markings of, of the foreign nations, I see that I see God sharing his love. He said, I don't want you to align yourself and align your spirit with, with them. I don't want you because there's a spirit connection that takes place. When you take on the identity of something, you also take on the spirit of that thing. So I'm trying to spare you from the demon spirit that's behind you. don't understand that. So I'm try, I told you to do these things to spare you from that demon spirit. What was that phrase, Benjamin? Come up here for a second. That phrase about that you told me earlier today. You know what I'm talking about? About the uh, uh, the, the one thing polluting the other thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, real quick. Listen. We're talking about uh, talking about music and how and, and and some of the hip hop and rap and and I saw this quote and this guy said when you take such a message, the word of God, and put it in such a form. The form degrades the message. The message does not lift up the form. So if you take the gospel of Jesus Christ and you dress it up like a prostitute, the, are you hearing me? The form degrades the message. The message doesn't elevate the form. Come on. If you take the name of Jesus Christ and 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 put it into a cultural phraseology and put an F word in the middle of it. Even if you think you're trying to do it in a positive manner. Come on. Are y'all hearing me? See, you degraded. The form degrades the message. The message doesn't raise the form. That's why God was very picky about form. Oh, my goodness. Come on. That's that. that there's a bomb right there. Shh. See, but I look at all, I look at the word of God and I look at, I see revelation. I see Jesus. I see love. I see mercy. Even throughout the Old Testament, I read the book of Jeremiah. You say, oh, it's so harsh. No, I hear God pleading, please turn to me. Please turn to me. Whew. And I need the word of God. I need that word to penetrate me. God said, I need that word to penetrate me. I need that word. Sometimes, you know what would happen when you get a wound and you got to scrape it out? Folks, it hurts. Y'all ever have anybody put some hydrogen peroxide? Huh? On an open wound? Some alcohol? Ah! Right? Hurts, but it needs to. Something has got to come and purify the wound because otherwise it will get infected and the wound which was not deadly can turn into a deadly infection that which was not deadly can kill you because it will it will continue to get uh, perverted it will continue to become more diseased and it will begin to enter into your bloodstream and that is why when the oh my romo shande i just got to say this see that's why you need the word that's why when the devil comes along whether through a tv program or whether through a person around you or whatever and sows a lie into you and 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 and, and or, or attacks you or you get hurt or you get wounded you know, you all ever been there, right? That you need to take the word of God that brings about a purification and a healing with it. 
Because if you let that thing sit there long enough, it'll get poisonous and more poisonous, and it'll enter your spiritual bloodstream. Hallelujah. Maybe that's why God commanded his people. He said, every day, he said, meditate upon these words day and night. Why? That you may be careful to observe all I command you. Meditate upon these, chew upon this. Now, the word will come. It not only brings a cleansing and a purging and a scraping out of the junk, but at the very time, the second side is a two-edged sword. The other side of that, of that knife will bring about a healing. The one side cuts out the junk and the other side cauterizes. The other side seals it up so it can start the healing process. And that is also why the Lord spoke to me this, and you'll see it here in this church. You'll see us do this. I remember one time I was in New Zealand, and I was out on the beach, and the Lord spoke to me a very strong, word, corrective word, and I was broken, guys. I was broken. I fell on my knees right in the beach, and I just was bawling my eyes out. All that night I was broken, repenting. Next day got up, went back out to the beach because we were staying in a little bungalow right there on the beach, and I went back out on the walk in the beach, and, Again, just started weeping and crying. And the Lord spoke to me and said, son, stop. He said, every time I deal with you strongly with my word, every time I bring you a hard word, he said, you must always come back to the Holy Spirit to receive a time of refreshing. He says, because if you just deal with the hard word, but you don't get the times of refreshing, he said, it'll become emotionally difficult for you to handle it, and you'll start, uh, start avoiding the strong word. The second side of the sword of the Spirit brings that healing and brings that touch. The first side has to cut out the junk. It does purify us, but it, there, there is some, there's some pain that will go with it. But the second side brings healing. Someone say Amen. It's interesting, before the priest went in, before God in the Holy of Holies, they had to come to the brazen laver. That's the place where they washed their hands and they washed their feet. Back to that verse I talked about, washing of the water of the word. They had to wash their hands and wash their feet every time before they entered the presence of God. What would happen? Just throwing a little thing out here. What would happen if every time before we came before prayer, every time before we came before worship, every time we came before the presence of God, we spent a few moments and we used the word to get cleansed? We used the word to get our minds focused on him. Because how many of you know circumstances of life will try to do everything you can to get your mind focused on other things? Come on, amen? And so you, you, you sit there. I, I do it all the time. I'll use worship because worship, true worship, true worship is the word, the revelation of the word expressed in song. Whew. Hallelujah. I'll use the word. I want the word. I, hallelujah. I want, I want to get the word in my spirit, whether it's through a song or whatever. I want it to cleanse my mind from all the junk and the conflicts of the day and all the distractions and get me focused so that I can come purified and washed afresh and anew as I'm coming before the Holy of Holies. Hallelujah. Go ahead and try that. Watch what will happen. Watch what will happen if every day, you start every day. I want to throw a little bomb out at you too, by the way. That you start every day with the Word of God. Okay, Brother Steve, when I get up at 7 a.m. or 6 a.m., I want to start every day. Well, that's wonderful. Why don't you start every day before you go to sleep? I'm going to start. Come on. I'm going to start my day. <laughs> I'm going to start my day in the Word. In fact, what, right before you go to sleep, just get some Word in you instead of that TV program, which runs over in your mind over and over and over again. Are you going to love it or are you going to list it? No, I want to think about Jesus. <laughs> some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about, but come on, amen. <laughs> Woo! Come on, I'm going to get the word in me. I'm going to fill my mind with a verse or subject. I don't have to go read a whole chapter. I'm just going to get a scripture, and I'm going to fill my mind. I'm going to meditate. Oh, Lord, let that word bubble in me all night long. Woo, glory to God. Ha, cleanse my mind before I go to sleep. Whew. Jesus said this in John chapter 15, verse 3. Is this good? I, I'm writing a lot of notes right here. 
Shh, hallelujah. Glory to God. Come on, come on. It's a, it's a, it's a sword. It's a dagger, right? Right? It, it purifies. Someone say purifies. Whoo, man, man. It purifies. It also heals. Say it heals. Oh, man. That's, I mean, oh, glory to God. Shh. Jesus said these words, <laughs> purifies and heals. He says in John chapter 15, verse 3, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. Man, glory to God. Why wouldn't we want more of the word? I know y'all do because that's why you come to one of the you come to the upper room church. You want to hear the word. Man, I'm clean because of the word which God spoke to me. Hallelujah. Joshua 1.8. I've already quoted this, but I'll say it. This book of the law, the word, shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. You shall mutter it. That word literally means to mutter under your breath. You shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then, ever say then, you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Anybody want to be prosperous and have good success? Then talk the word all the time. Come on, talk the word all the time. Huh? Talk the word all the time. Just meditate upon the word. Hallelujah. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Woo. <laughs> he who began a good work in me shall bring it unto completion. I'm more than a conqueror. <laughs> the joy of the Lord is my strength. <laughs> huh? The Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Be ye holy. See, I would use that. I would use that as a weapon against the enemy. I remember when I first got saved, I, I was learning about taking captive every thought and making it obedient to Christ. Got this little image in my mind that I had a shopping cart every day. I'd push around because I had a lot of thoughts, so I needed a shopping cart, not just a little baggie. And I, 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 I'd push the shopping cart, and every time I had a wrong thought, I'd just say, I'd bind that in Jesus' name, and I'd take it captive, and I'd cast it down in the shopping cart. Got to the end of each day, and I'd just present the shopping cart to Jesus. Here you go. Take these thoughts away. Huh? But what I'd also do is I'd not only cast that thought down, but I'd always do something proactive. Put that in your spirit if you're going to be in spiritual warfare. Don't just remove something, because if you just remove something, but you don't fill up with something, he'll bring out seven... He'll be back seven friends worse than he was. That thing will come back. So I had to fill it up. So I'd bind that lustful thought that would come in my mind. I'd cast that down. And I'd say, the Bible says, be holy, for your Father in heaven is holy. <laughs> the Bible says, you have the mind of Christ. So every time the wrong thought came in, I would fight it. I would cast it down, take authority, bind it, cast it down. And then I would bring the word, use the word to bring a healing and a purification and a cleansing to my mind. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. How many, how many were here Sunday morning? How many were here Sunday morning? What an incredible message. We're going to be challenging beginning September 1st. Some of you are already practicing. I hope so. Uh, September, all of September 3rd, 30 days. 30 days of praise or 30 days of blessing. 30 days that we're going to say, Lord, I thank you for it. No complaining, no griping about nothing. Now, I promise you, you're going to fail miserably. I know I did. I did this morning. I was pulling in. I was pulling in, and there was a guy who parked way across the line, and then forced somebody else way across the line, and then a big truck way across the line. And I want to turn it, and and I and I and there was only one little spot, and I got a little car, and it was going to be tight. And I said, "Man, these people that always cross the line." And I caught myself, and I said, "Wait a minute, Lord, I thank you for big trucks." I thank you for big trucks. And it was Bishop Jeff Larson's truck, by the way. So I had to go upstairs and confess it to him. <laughs> but we're going to bring Thanksgiving. What? Well, and one of the things we're going to do is we're going to give you, and every week we're going to give you a week's worth. We're going to give you things every day to thank God for. Give you verses. Come on, every day, verses. Areas that to be, there's all, it's all over the Bible. Areas to be thankful for and to thank God for. Why? We're going to put that word on our mouth. Lord, I thank you. You're going to be diving down and say, Lord, I thank you for stoplights. 
I thank you for paved roads. Mostly paved. Come on. I thank you there's money to do the destruction and the construction. Right? Lord, I thank you it's not 30 below outside. Right? Oh, my gosh. And the Lord told me, he said, when this happens, he says, there's going to be such healing in people's bodies. He said, there's going to be such release of stress in their minds and healing in their minds and healing in their relationships. Woo. Why? It's the power of his word. Come on, it's the, oh, my Lord. Someone said the devil's a liar. Meditate, speak the word. Use the word to keep yourself pure. Use the word to pick it. That's why, that, that's, why, that's why the devil is such a liar. This thing that's trying to diminish the word. These preachers, big name, grace preacher out there, declaring that you don't listen to most of what Jesus had to say because he was preaching under the law. Excuse me, you just said don't listen to Jesus. I ain't listening to you. Well, I had a revelation from God. Yeah, you did, from a little G. One that's going to be bound into the lake of fire. Because you didn't hear, Jesus didn't tell you don't listen to me. Yeah. Huh? Come on, amen. You think it's so nuts, but I'm telling you, by the millions. <laughs> They're lapping it up. But the Bible warned us about it. The Bible warned us about it. Let me just get, get there for a moment. I'm, I'm not trying to go off on a tangent, but I'm on a tangent. But, 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 just, just, just for 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3, it just warned us about it. Verse 1, but you know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves. You know what they're going to do? And that, by the way, that's phileo. That's not agape. They're going to prefer themselves above anything else. They're going to be, they're going to be about what is, makes them feel best. Shh. They're going to be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, un. Agape, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, despisers of good, by the way, despisers of morality, <laughs> traitors, I can't read the next one, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Its power what? Its power to deliver you from wickedness. Yeah, yeah. Ha and then he goes on and says, have nothing to do with them. They're deceived. They've rejected the word of God. I don't care how many miracles. I don't care how many angels show up with little tutus dancing. I don't care. If they're denying the word of God, run. Come on, run. Get out of that. Oh, oh, but they're so anointed. There's a spirit. No, it is the word. Everybody say it's the word. Shh. Come on. Psalm 107 verse 20 says this. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from all their destructions. Psalm 138. Woo, glory to God. 138. Let's begin with verse 1. I didn't have that one plot written down, but go ahead and put it up there. Psalm 138, verse, beginning with verse 1. I will praise you with my whole heart before the gods. I will sing praises to you. Verse 2. I will worship towards your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth, for you have magnified your word above all your name. You have magnified your word even above your name, which means authority. You have magnified your word above even your authority, which means you have put your word above even your son. Which means you will never override your word. Mm, he said something. My word, huh, my covenant, I will not break nor alter the thing that's gone out of my lip. Heaven and earth will pass away before one dot or tittle of this word passes away. 
Hallelujah. God says, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever, that you be not destroyed. Hallelujah. That God is not bringing you progressive revelation that contradicts his word. He's bringing deeper revelation of his word. Hallelujah. And this word has, some say it has power. That's why also we preach the word. We don't have to beat people up. We don't have to get mean-spirited about it. But we preach the word. Why? Because the word will penetrate. The Bible says it'll penetrate. It divides soul and spirit, joint and marrow. That's why people don't want you to preach the word. That's why the media doesn't want us to say the word. They want us to back down from the word because they can't run from the word. We just have, you can do it, do it lovingly. Do it with love. Do it with, with a compassionate heart. Do it with brokenness. Absolutely. But preach the word. Because faith coming by hearing and hearing by the word. Even Paul said, if an angel or even if we come and preach a gospel different than which you have received, he said, don't listen to it. Don't receive it. <laughs> when Jesus faced the devil himself. Now, I know I call the devil a dumb devil, but God didn't even, Jesus didn't even do that. Listen. When Jesus faced the devil himself, Luke chapter 4, beginning with verse 1, then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. That's a whole other message by there. By the way, sometimes the Holy Ghost leads you into those battles. Nothing went wrong. Something's about to go right. Mm. Being tempted for 40 days by the devil. He wasn't tempted just three days. For 40 days he was tempted. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterwards, when he had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, now I want you to look at this. At the end of the 40 days he was hungry. He had completed his fast. He was at the point, from what this seems to say, of breaking his fast. So he was ready to eat. Are y'all hearing me? The devil wasn't trying to get him to break his fast. He had finished his fast. The devil was trying to get him to break his covenant with God. Watch this. He turned to him and he said, If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is... A personal revelation of mine. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. Then the devil, verse 5, then the devil taking you up on a high mountain showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and all and their glory. For this has been delivered to me. And that was true. And I give it to whom I wish. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. I'm going to give you an opportunity to bypass the price of death that needs to be paid for you to get it. See, the devil always tried to give you a shortcut. Oh, my. I love what Jesus did, though. Jesus responded, verse 8. And Jesus said to him, get behind me, Satan, for it is. Someone say, it is written. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. See, sometimes the enemy will come at you, and he'll lie to you, and he'll try to give you a way of getting something that is right in a wrong manner. 
He'll, it'll, be, it'll be the vision. Jesus knew he was come to take over the rulership of the entire earth. He knew that he was going to come. He knew that he was coming in that role. And in that, y'all with me on this. He knew that he was coming in that role and in that place. And, and, and yet the devil was operating, offering to him a way to bypass the death process, to bypass the suffering process, to bypass the price that had to be paid and said, if you'll just worship me, I'll give it to you. You can get it a different way. And the same way the devil comes to us, all these lies. And that's the same way. Yes, Holy Ghost. That's the same thing that the devil's trying to do today to tell people that you can be right with God without having to give something up. You can have all the blessing of grace without any requirement for repentance. Just worship me. Just worship a lie. Matthew chapter, his sword, of the sword. I got to come in for a landing here. Father, I give you praise. Shaka, lift your hands. I tell you, I feel the anointing here right now. Karabu shahande. I'm only not about a third way done, but karabu shahande. Shikarabababa shaka ba shahande. Shandarabababa kaka bo shande. Shiriandarabababa kaka shande. Shindarababo shande. Mandarebebebebo kokobo shahande. Brindarebo shande. Bakahande. Shakabobo shande. Kekabo shande. Brinde. Brinderebo shande. Then, verse 9. Let's put verse 9 up. Then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And said to him, you are the son of God. If you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. Now here is where the devil now is like, okay, he's using the word against me. I'm going to pervert the word. And I'm going to try to get him to, to, to I'm going to pervert the word to try to get him to act and to prove himself. Let, let me just drop that right there. You're always in trouble when you try to use the covenant and the promises and the anointing of God to prove yourself. That's a trap. Oh, yeah. Don't you ever. You don't need to prove yourself. Hallelujah. God himself will put his glory upon you and say, this is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I'm well pleased. You don't have to ever prove yourself. Hallelujah. Come on, amen. Hallelujah. Stop. Oh, look at me. Look at me. I'm anointed. Look at me. I'm used to a God. Look at me. Look at me. No, that you've fallen into the trap already. And in their hands they shall. He used two verses. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. And Jesus answered and said, it, it has been said, you shall not tempt. The Lord your God. You're trying to pervert a part of the scripture to get me for to use it for personal benefit, but I'm going to bring you the whole counsel of God. I'm not going to use just a portion to bring me personal benefit and to back up a certain thing that I want to do. I'm going to use the whole counsel of God, and I'm not going to tempt the Lord thy God. And the Bible says that the devil departed for him for a more opportune time because the devil realized I can't penetrate him. As long as he keeps using the word against me, I have no ability to beat him up. That's why the Bible Paul says, take on the whole armor of God. You pick up that sword of the spirit and you start using it as a mighty weapon against the enemy. And then the Bible says that Jesus came out. Go ahead and come on up, Benjamin. The Bible says Jesus came out of the wilderness. I love this. He came out of the wilderness, verse 14, then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee. When you come out of those seasons and you've been using the Word of God as a weapon against the enemy, you're going to come out so full of the Holy Ghost and fire. You're not going to come out beat up. You're not going to come out, oh, it's been such a hard time. You're going to be full of faith and power. Oh, come on, somebody. Help me out here a little bit. Whew, somebody say, I'm going to use the Word. Say it again. Say, I'm going to use the word. It heals. Come on. It purifies. The word also repels. <laughs> it repels the enemy. <laughs> I've shared this story before, but I'm going to end with this. Whew. I was 
young Christian went to sleep one night, had been preaching, had our youth group going, and some Satanists had come in on the Friday night meeting. Remember, we got a meeting this Friday night, by the way. It's going to be powerful. <sighs> Last Friday night for, for now. But, so don't miss it. And they went out of that meeting. They were trying to disrupt the meeting. They went out of that meeting. We found out later they did an animal sacrifice. They sent curses, demon spirits after me. Next night while I was asleep, these demons came and visited me. Actually, one jumped on top of me physically. I felt it jump on top of me, a bright flash of light. I was in a deep sleep, but I felt it. And I was in that stage where you, you want to speak, but your mouth doesn't work yet. And it wouldn't come, nothing come out. So I kept thinking, Jesus, 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 until my mouth worked. And then all of a sudden, Jesus. And when I said it, that demon jumped off me. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> yes, Lord, shut my back. I'll get there in a second. Just <sighs> <Woo. And> that <laughs> that demon jumped off me. You're about to see some very strong manifestations of demon power in people in these services. They're going to come in demon possessed, and God is going to radically deliver them. Right in the middle, sometimes in the preaching, some are going to start screaming out, Don't you be afraid. You just turn and speak the word. You don't have to sit there and say, Oh, Pastor Steve, come cast that thing out. You have power and authority in the name of Jesus. You cast that thing out. Others are going to be delivered. You're not even going to see a strong manifestation in the sense of outward because the power of God's going to be so strong and just grip them, but you're going to see it happen. Bam. My God. There's a lot. And yes, Holy Ghost, there's a lot of people that have been carrying devils that are hidden devils. They have been tucked down and buried so deep that, that, in, in, that they, and they go in and out of church and they don't... And there's never, there's not been enough power to even uproot it, so it stays hidden. Hello, but there's going to be such an authority of God, such an anointing of God. Those hidden devils are not going to be able to stay hidden any longer. Hallelujah. My Lord, shakara basande, shikahande. Yes, Lord. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Yes, Father. Karabu Shande. Shika Hande. Can I share with you a little more prophetically with something I'm saying right now? We're going to do, I, I, and I, I've done these all over the world, but we're going to do even from here we're, and, and from our new church. Glory to God. Our new beautiful facility with a prayer room and all that other. Hallelujah. We're going to have pastors' conferences. And I saw it. I just saw it. There are going to be hundreds of pastors that, that, that people that are in pastor, and they're in ministry. They're in ministry, but they got devils. They, they, they've been demonized, and God's going to deliver them, I, I tell you. Now, do you, do you say, uh, let me just say this quick. You say, Pastor Steve, are you saying a Christian can be demon-possessed? I don't believe Christians are demon-possessed in their spirit, but they sure can have a demon in their spirit or their mind. And that always in Christians is because of unforgiveness. So I cast this demon off me. I said, Jesus, I'm sorry, and it jumped off me. And then I said, I bind you, Jesus, and I cast you out. He left the room, and I rolled back over to go to sleep. And then another one came in. And I yeah, bound that one, cast out. Then another one came in. After a couple minutes of that, I realized I'm not going to be able to sleep. So I got up, and I began to bind these demons. And, uh, and I'm, and I'm, I'm standing, my bed's there, and I'm standing there. There's a window here, and I'm just binding it. And, and it's like I kick them out, and I can feel like other will come in. And then I kick them out. And I literally felt the direction they're going. And all of a sudden, God opened my eyes, and I saw outside of the, the building I was in, outside of my home, I saw this big demon, and he had all these little punk demons around him. 
and, and I'd kick him out, and he'd pick him up, and he'd throw one back in. He was afraid to come. He was throwing the little minions in. And so I just got mad, and I said, that's it. I bind you in the name of Jesus, but I command you not to go. And I reached over, and I grabbed my Bible. And for the next 30 minutes, I read Scripture to it. And, and every scripture I could think of, every scripture that had to deal with the destruction of the enemy. The Bible says you're going to be cast down and the worms are going to eat you. That the men, the men are going to look upon you and the kings are going to say, is this the one that slew the nations? The Bible says you're going to be bound in the lake of fire. The Bible says no weapon formed against me shall prosper. The Bible says, behold, I give it to thee power over all the power of the enemy. And I kept grabbing the word, the word, the word for a half an hour. After 30 minutes, I said, I, I said, you can go now. I release you. And I never felt a demon leave me faster. Bam, gone. They never came back and messed with me in my dreams again. Because this word has power. Somebody say this word has power. Say it again. Say this word has power. Shakarama. That's why the word of God in your mouth will set the captives free. That's why the Word of God in your mouth will produce the blessing of God. That's the why the Word of God in your mouth will drive back the devils and demons. Don't you let the devil ever, ever intimidate you or lie to you. He has to go because there's a power and a force in the Word. The Word of God is living and active. It's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword. Woo! Shakarama Sunday.